Father, we are tremendously thankful to be able to uh, be in your presence this morning, to be in your house, to be with your people. Uh, we, we love you and are just so tremendously thankful for the chance that you've given us to be able to praise you, to be able to reflect on the gift of eternal life that you've given to us, reflect on the reality that you're still moving and working in our midst. I thank you for uh, the individual who professed Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior this week. I thank you for uh, the Asbury revival, for the way that that has spread through multiple locations across our land, and we pray it would continue to spread, that you would revive the hearts of your people, that you would draw lost souls unto yourself, giving us a heightened sensitivity and awareness of our sin and giving us a clear vision of who you are, who we are as, as sinful creatures before a holy God. Father, I pray that you would revive our hearts even in, in these moments. So God, we want to take just a moment to quiet our hearts before you and to confess those things that are burdens to us, confess those areas of struggle and sin, And so would you now just take just a moment to confess whatever sin you might be carrying this morning. Would you confess that to the Lord right now? Father, we would, we would ask that you'd be at work in the next generation and the lives of our young people that you would spare them from casual, uncommitted Christianity. God, we pray for marriages that are struggling, that you would heal broken hearts, that you would humble pride, that you would work reconciliation in our midst. Father, we pray for those who are struggling physically as well. We think of Connie Snyder and Patty McCracken. We pray that you would heal their bodies and restore health to them. We're so thankful for them, their testimony. We pray that you'd magnify their testimonies, help them to bloom right where they're planted. Father, now we want to we wanna just yield and surrender ourselves to you. God, give us ears to hear your word this morning. Give us hearts to obey. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, how many left-handed people do we have this morning? Raise those left hands. Wow, man, I did not expect that. We have a lot of left-handed folks. Now, you know that we live in a right-handed world, right? All you left-handers, you, you know this. You understand this intuitively. So you're actually in good company, too. Did you know that, that Ronald Reagan was left-handed? So was Bill Clinton and Oba President Obama and uh, George W. Bush, all left-handed. So you're, you're in decent company. You know that when uh, you're trying to write as a kid, if you're left-handed, what, what happens? You, you smear ink all over the page, right? A little bit of a disadvantage. What's it like learning how to use scissors when you're left-handed? A little bit of a challenge. I don't know how many of you left-handed people golf. How easy is it to find golf clubs that fit you when you're... Yeah, I don't know why you'd bother with that either. When, <laughs> it's not personal. I just, uh, the way you hold your playing cards, it's hard to see your numbers, right? Zippers. My goodness, how do you navigate, especially on men's pants? The flap goes the wrong way. I don't know this from experience. I, this is just from what people have, have told me. But the advantages of being left-handed are not so obvious. Did you know that left-handed people are more likely to be geniuses? I know, who, who'd have thought? And if you paid attention to who was holding their hands up, you would understand. <laughs> Le left-handed left people actually are more likely to have IQs of over 140. I mean, it's true, you can look this up. I, what's the correlation? I have no idea. 
Uh, but in sports, look at the advantage of being a left-hander. You know, when you talk about left-handed pitchers and things like that, you know, right-handed batters, right -hand, the other right-handed opponents often don't see what's coming at them because of the, the element of surprise from the left-hander. Did you know that left-handed people can see better underwater than right-handed people? <laughs> it's true. But throughout history, left-handedness has definitely... <clears throat> been considered a, a weakness. The Latin word for left is actually sinister, which means evil. The French word for left is gauche, which means awkward. The English word, the original root, it comes from an old English word that means weak. So definitely left-handedness is seen as a, a disadvantage. But this morning, left-handedness plays an important role in showing us how God works in our lives and how God works in the world. So one of Israel's very first judges was actually a lefty, and his name was Ehud. And what we see with Ehud's left-handedness is that his flaw actually became his forte. His adversity became his advantage. His deficit became a benefit. So I wonder what disadvantages you may be carrying into church this morning? What adversity is God wanting to work to your advantage? What flaw is he looking to transform into your forte? What, what deficit is he looking to redeem that it might become your benefit? See, Ehud shows us that God wants to use your weakness to strengthen your faith and to bless others. And so here's what we need to get this morning. Big idea that God loves to use flawed, limited people to do limitless things. Have you ever experienced that? Judges chapter 3, if you brought your Bibles, go ahead and turn there with me. If you don't have a Bible with you, grab the one down in the seat in front of you. We're uh, around page 132. Judges chapter 3, we're going to start in verse 12, where it says, again, the Israelites did evil. Remember that cycle that we looked at last week. We see this repeated over and over again. So here we are, back at the beginning of the cycle. Big trouble for Israel. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and because they did this evil, the Lord gave Eglon, king of Moab, power over Israel. He gathered to himself the people of Ammon and Amalek, went and defeated Israel, took possession of the city of Palms. That's a big deal, the city of Palms. The city of Palms is actually another name for Jericho. Again, we see these connections going back to the book of Joshua, where God worked an incredible miracle of deliverance. If you know the story about Joshua and the Israelites marching around the city of Jericho, and the walls miraculously come tumbling down, and they're able to sack the city. <clears throat> well, now we have just the opposite has happened. Uh, now it's become a stronghold of the enemy. And, and it represents Israel's defeat because of their sin. So the children of Israel served Eglon, king of Moab, 18 years. Uh, this was horrific oppression. We know from history that, that Eglon was a wicked, vile, cruel man. And that his, his reign was marked by rape and murder and genocide. But when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, which you would expect them to do, remember the judges cycle, they're in distress. The Lord responds... In grace and mercy, he raises up a deliverer for them, Ehud, the son of Gera, a Benjamite. But the tribe of Benjamin actually means son of the right hand. So a little bit of uh, irony working there. He was a left-handed man. By him, the children of Israel sent tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. You know, sometimes uh, we wonder when things are rough, like it is right here in this snapshot that we have where Israel at, is at in its history, things are incredibly rough. They're being oppressed. And sometimes we wonder, when things aren't going well in our lives, is this God paying me back? Have you ever wondered that? God, this is, this is really hard. And I know that I have messed up. And I know that I have failed you. And man, I can trace that thread of failure 
back, in some of our cases, for decades. Is this your way of paying me back, God? What we need to understand from our, our text this morning is that God's not trying to pay you back. In every case of suffering, it doesn't matter what it is, the intention of his heart is not to pay you back. It's to bring you back. Always. No exception. So I'm not trying to say that, that all suffering is tied to something that, that God is trying to correct. Sometimes it's, it's just him trying to teach you to trust and hope in him more. See, the fruit of hard times that God is always looking for is humility. Always looking to work humility in our lives. So I, I think about uh, me and Jamie's marriage in our early days. You know, if you've heard me talk about marriage, you've heard me talk about how, man, our first year in particular, going by, I, we could even say the first couple years, man, they were hard. We had some humdinger knockdown dragouts. <laughs> I mean, it, you know, it, you, you don't expect marriage to be like that. You think that when you're getting, you're all starry-eyed when you get engaged and you're in love, and, and you have people that will tell you, they're, 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 I know they're well-intentioned, they tell you, they warn you about that first year. They talk about how hard that first year is. We thought we'd be the exception. I mean, we never argued when we were dating. And I'll tell you what, I think it's because we worked so hard at reconciliation that God, in the course of time, gave us a wonderful, strong marriage. We're now, we're able to do premarital counseling with young couples and we try to do the same thing with them, and we fail, that other people try to do for us. And we try to set them up for success in that first year. Look, I know you guys, everyone thinks that they're the exception, but just so you know, it's, it's coming, but it's, it's normal. See, and that for me is, is one of the experiences that I've had that God has blessed Jamie and I in the course of our lives, that our flaw became our forte. Our adversity became our advantage. Our deficit became our benefit. Well, as we uh, go on into to verse 15 there at, at the end up on the screen, that phrase, left-handed, uh, it, it literally means that he could not use his right hand. Probably an indication that, that there was some kind of disability on the part of, of Ehud, that his, his right hand was perhaps withered. Uh, there's clearly something wrong with it for him to be left-handed because in that day... They believed that, that right there was a lot of superstition and things like that about, about being left-handed. It was, it was a demonstration of, of weakness. As you can see from, from some of the languages and the, 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 the etymology of where that, that word originates. So they, even, if, even if he was just uh, naturally inclined to be left-handed, parents back then actually would have bound children's left hand behind their back to force them to become right-handed. So the fact that Ehud is left-handed even into adulthood is indication that there was something missing or something wrong with his right hand. That's an important part of the story because it, it highlights his weakness. See, our society is, is cruel to people with disabilities. How much more so in ancient times? So a, a guy with, who is not right-handed back then would have been viewed as useless. He would have been thought of as useless. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt useless? Have you ever wondered if God has any use for you? Maybe like you don't fit in. And you can actually understand why Ehud might have been chosen to go before Eglon to pay tribute to him. Because he never would have been seen as a threat. He was a man with a disability. So did you know that God can use you and that he wants to use you in spite of your limitations? This is, it's so very true. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, it says, For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. 
No advantages here. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low, despised in the world, viewed as useless, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became, became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. That's amazing. Some of you may need to claim that passage as your life verse because you feel exactly like that. That compared with the rest of the world, man, you just don't measure up, you just don't fit in. And I think this points us to the most unexpected and left-handed person ever. See, like Ehud, Jesus, our Lord and Savior, came in absolute weakness. Think about this. Think about how poor Jesus came into this world. Think about how disadvantaged he was being born into an unwed family. Jesus was an absolutely unlikely savior. Then that's why that's why he solicited such hostility from the uh, religious right, the, 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 the fanatics, the, the Pharisees. See, people didn't see Jesus coming back then. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 53, we see an account of this. This is actually written 700 years before Jesus came to this earth, where the prophet Isaiah, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, said, he had no form or majesty that we should look at him. No beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not, did not think very highly of him. You would have never looked at Jesus and thought, well, there's the Savior of the world. Clearly, that's the guy I'm supposed to follow. No, probably not good-looking, not commanding. Why? Why would he come in weakness? Why would he come under such disadvantages in society, culturally? Well, just like Ehud's job was to pay tribute to Eglon and the Moabites, Jesus came to pay the tribute for you and for me, to pay the ransom, to pay the price, to give himself, to give his very life as the offering, to free us from the oppression of sin and hell and Satan that would seek to destroy your life. He came not to call the self-righteous to himself, but he came to call sinners. He came to free those who are oppressed and, and, and bondage to sin. He came to proclaim the truth. He came to save the lost. He came to serve and to give his life as a ransom to save you. He came that you might have life and not just have life, but have it more abundantly. He came for you. All of those things... He came to do for you. Have you experienced him doing that for you? So he had volunteers to deliver a tribute payment to Eglon. He loads up his wagon, if you can imagine this, with gold, but he also packs a little surprise. We move on now to verse 16, where it says that now Ehud made a double-edged sword about a cubit long, which would have been approximately 18 inches, which he strapped to his right thigh under his clothing. See, God takes your weakness and what little you do have to offer him, and he makes you effective. See, he's looking for people who will surrender all that they have. Now, think about this, going back to uh, one of the accounts that we have in the Gospels that actually appears in all four Gospels. The, the young man who offered his two loaves and his five fish among a crowd of over 5,000 people. And what did Jesus do with that measly little offering? Okay, you, you can think of it like a Hebrew happy meal. That, that's all it really amounted to. What did Jesus do with that little boy's offering? See, God loves to use little, limited people to do limitless things. Do you want to be used by God? Do you want to make a difference for him? Do you want to make a difference for, for him at home? Do you want to make a difference for him at school, at work? Well, what do you have to do? What does God need from you 
if he's going to redeem your adversity and transform it into a kingdom advantage, how do you need to position yourself? Well, before I come to our next point, i got to give you a disclaimer. Jamie told me that I needed to do this. you got to understand something about me. You can take the boy out of youth ministry, but you cannot take the youth ministry out of the boy. I believe that this story is one of God's great demonstrations to junior high boys that he loves you. <laughs> Do you know what junior high boys spend most of their time talking with each other about? It's coming. It's coming. So number one, I, look, this comes straight from the text. I'm not trying to be crass or anything like this. I'm just trying to make this memorable so it sticks. Number one, what does God need from you if he's going to redeem your adversity and turn it into an advantage? you got to be fat. We're going somewhere with this. <laughs> fat stands for something. And you'll see the play on words. If you understand a little bit about Eglon, you, you know where I'm going with this. But for right now, God is looking for fat people. Okay, Not physically fat, but fat, faithful, available, teachable. That's what we see from Ehud to this point in the story. How do we know he was faithful? Well, the entire nation was behind him. He was the one appointed to represent the nation to go before King Eglon. He had to have been a faithful, trustworthy man for him to have been chosen to do that. And Jesus said, he who is faithful with little can be trusted with more. Is that you? Are you faithful with a little? Kids, are you faithful with your bedroom? What responsibilities has God given to you? What does your room look like this morning? Did you make your bed? I know I'm stepping on the toes of some adults right now because I can see some spouses. I, I saw the elbow getting thrown a little bit. Kids, do you have pets? If it were up to you, I mean, if your parents died today, what would happen to your pets by the end of the week? What responsibilities is, are you faithful? See, God wants to help you be faithful with little so that he can make you faithful with much. Can God trust you to be faithful with little? You got to be available. You got to be available. See, in God's kingdom, availability is more important than ability. You ever felt like you don't, like you don't fit in? You don't, you don't have anything to contribute. You're the last one to get picked for the kickball team every single time. Hate that, don't you? Okay, your ability in God's kingdom is not what's important. It's availability. We see that in the life of Ehud. Here's a disabled man. Are you surrendered to God and willing to do whatever he asks you to do? That's what it means to be available. Right, think about this. Have you ever surrendered to God in such a way that you've said to him, here I am, God. What do you want me to do? How would you have me spend my life? I know that it can't be about me. What would you have me to do? I think sometimes we have this skewed version of God, this, this payback version of God, where we think that God is a cosmic killjoy out to get us, and if I surrender my life to him, he's going to make me a missionary to Africa or something like that, something miserable that I, I, I don't want to do, and I'm not ever going to be able to have a boyfriend or a girlfriend, and I'm never going to make a lot of money, I'll never have a nice car, and ah! Like, that's, you don't understand the heart of God. His plan is always better than your plan. No exceptions. Always. So do you trust God with your future? Do you trust God with big decisions, with your direction in life? Do you trust him with your hurts? Do you trust God with your relationships? Or are you still just kind of trusting God with just the little bits and pieces of your life? Are you living with open hands and an open heart toward God? Are you teachable? Teachable. You think about Ehud. He learned how to fight with his left hand. He learned how to fashion a dagger. So... What are you learning? How are you working on becoming more effective for God? How are you growing to become more effectively useful for him? Are you growing spiritually and becoming more distinct from the rest of the world? Because you're becoming more like Jesus. 
See, Ehud didn't let his deficits discourage him from being used by God. So sometimes you have to focus on what you do have and not obsess about what you don't have. you got to focus on your forte and not your flaw. Every single one of us has strengths that we can use for him. You know, for me as, as a kid, I could barely finish a sentence and put a period at the end of it. My mind just didn't work that way. Terrible at communication. And Jamie would say that I still have a long ways to go. She, she will tell you. I would have never won, I, never ever would I have thought it. What I'm doing right now is my biggest fear. Do you know that more people fear public speaking than they fear death? I am that statistic. What's that all about? What, what am I doing here? I, I don't know. Some days I wonder. <laughs> but no kidding. When, when I was a kid, my brain just didn't work in a way that I could actually string two sentences together and they made sense to people. And if for some of you were around, you know, 20 plus years ago when I first started preaching, and you would say, yes, I, I remember that version of Jeff Bartz. <clears throat> what is it that you have that makes you feel left-handed? Maybe for you it's communication like it was for me. But are you willing to surrender that thing? Are you willing to be used by God? Are you willing to say, here I am, God, take me, use me, do, do whatever you want with me. I'm, I'm surrendered, here's my life. Well, we go on in, in verse 17 now. It says that, that Ehud presented the tribute to Eglon, and here's where we turn junior high, who was a very fat man. Yes, it's in the Bible. Okay, that seems like an irrelevant detail, doesn't it? No, this is, this is extremely important. You have to understand something about the origin of Eglon's name. And it, it just sounds evil, doesn't it? That's a great villain name, Eglon. Eglon is actually literally translated little calf. And you have to understand the, the, the message that God is working up here. And, and how God can actually orchestrate the details of people's lives, like he did Eglon, to come to this point in history to teach the world for generations very important lessons. See, Eglon began as a little calf, but he has grown into a very fat man. So his descriptions at this point in, in the story of his hefty body are meant to depict him as a fattened calf ready for slaughter. Because he is God's enemy. He has set himself in opposition to God's plan, program, and his people. And so the Israelites are now in a position where they have to offer tribute to him, payments to him, just as the pagan people did to deities at that time, making offerings to him as if he's a deity. See, Eglon set himself up as a deity in defiance of God. We see people doing that in our culture all over the place, setting themselves in opposition to God. Do you know people like that today? See, it's significant that Eglon's very fat body appears here in verse 17. And it's also in the context of four references to this word tribute or offering. We see it in, in verse 15. I have it highlighted here. Uh, in verse 17. In verse 18, it appears twice. W what's with that? Why is it sandwiched between those? Because Eglon became so fat that he was feasting on Israel's harvest, taking advantage of them, exploiting them. The irony, though, was that as he became fattened by the, the, the people's tributes, he was actually fattening himself to be slaughtered. See, his fat actually embodies arrogance and the abuse of power. We see a very spiritual reality manifested in his physical presence. And the only thing fatter than Eglon in the story was Eglon's ego. Egotistical Eglon. Man, and there are just junior high jokes galore that I am trying to refrain myself from right now. <laughs> Eglon shows us, though, it does not go well for those who oppose God. Never. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. 
God's plan A is always humility. What's plan B? Humiliation. It's coming for Eglon. It's coming. Eglon chose wrong. Charles Spurgeon, I love how he put this, when he said this, he who would place himself in front of a fast-moving railway car will be crushed and would be no more foolish than you who are opposing the gospel. If the gospel is true, truth is mighty and it will prevail. Who are you to attempt to stand against it? You will be crushed. Well, but let me tell you, when the railway car runs over you, the wheel will not be raised even an inch by your size. Poor creatures, they're like a gnat who thinks he can quench the sun. Go, tiny insect, and do it if you can. You'll only burn your wings and die. Likewise, there may be a fly who thinks it could drink the ocean dry. Drink the ocean if you can, O fly. More likely you will sink in it, and it will drink you. Whole lot of people in our society today propping themselves up as gnats in the face of God. See, you can always trust that God's agenda is going to be accomplished. His name is going to be glorified and that those who stand against him, they expose themselves as little measly gnats on a train track, defying an oncoming train. See, God's word tells us all about these people and it gives us hope and encouragement because you might be in the context of a relationship right now or, or maybe in your workplace or, or family where you experience this reality, someone propping themselves up in opposition to God. And you live with some measure of oppression in your life as a result of it. Psalm 37 offers us hope where it says, do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land. Feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Rest in the Lord. Wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. He's nothing more than a gnat, standing in opposition to an oncoming train. See, we learn here in the book of Judges that the stories of our suffering, God can turn into stories of redemption. See, Israel was crushed under the weight of oppression, the weight of King Eglon. The author doesn't spend much time here on Israel's oppression. Why? Instead, it relishes in Eglon's defeat. See, he's able to retell a part of Israel's painful history with new colors. We, we see this story painted now with joy instead of despair. Laughter, you're, you're intended to laugh at the presence of Eglon. See, the focus is not on oppression. And because of this reality, the stories of our suffering, God can transform into stories of redemption. So if you're in pain, you have to know this. God doesn't turn a blind, a blind eye. That pain is real. Even if it's caused by your sin or whether somebody else's sin against you or just simply the brokenness of this world. But Israel's able to transform a painful chapter into a hilarious one, a joy-filled one, a victorious one, because they have seen the story written from God's perspective. C.S. Lewis once said, God's presence will make the worst of human experiences seem as fleeting as one bad night in a cheap hotel. You know, looking back on it, I've had some pretty crummy hotel experiences. So have you. I see you smiling about them right now. It wasn't so bad. You lived through it, didn't you? That's great perspective from C.S. Lewis. The Apostle Paul put it like this. Our present sufferings are not even worth comparing to the glory that God will reveal in us. All right, what does God need from you? To redeem your adversity and turn it into a kingdom advantage. You've got to be fat, number one. 
Number two, you've got to trust God with your life. This sounds simplistic. This is so profound. See, are you willing to put yourself out there? Are you willing to be bold enough for Christ and to make it known that you're a Christian? For it actually to become clear to the people around you, whether it's family members, whether it's classmates, teammates, coworkers, that you're a Christian. Are you willing to risk your reputation, your status, your relationships? You've got to trust God with your life. You know, do you trust God with your decisions? Do you trust him with your future? Do you trust him with your finances? He wants the whole thing. Are you trusting him with the whole thing, not just bits and pieces? See, Ehud risked it all. He risked his own life. Could have very easily been killed at any point in, in this story. Jesus ex said it like this, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. See, Ehud goes a step further now. When he had finished presenting the tribute, he sent away the people who had carried the tribute. But he himself turned back from the stone images that were at Gilgal and said, I have a secret message for you, O king. Heglon was like, ooh, a secret message. Maybe it's a snack, right? <laughs> but by signaling toward the stone images... This gave Eglon the perception that this was actually an oracle from God because the stone images were idols. Notice where those idols were set up. Gilgal. And if you were with us in previous weeks, you might recognize that name. It might sound familiar because Gilgal was the place of deliverance. Gilgal is translated rolled away. And what it's in reference to was that time in Israel's history when God rolled away the guilt of their sin and he forgave them. And now look at the irony of what's happening in Gilgal. And so Ehud makes this gesture back to the stone images, the idols set up in Gilgal that is no longer a place of deliverance, but one day will be again. And, and now look at his response. Eglon says, keep silence. And all who attended him went out from him. I don't know what picture comes to, you, uh, comes to your mind when you, you read about the appearance of Eglon and what this is like, but I just happen to be a Star Wars fan. So I think of you know, Eglon being large and in charge. <laughs> Looks probably something like this. Jabba the Hutt. And here comes Luke, if you can imagine, Ehud is Luke Skywalker, and he comes with his little 18-inch lightsaber. And so Ehud came to him. Now, he was sitting upstairs in his cool private chamber. And then Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. So Eglon arose from his seat. Do you know what it would have taken for Eglon to have arose from his seat? A whole lot of excitement further emphasizing he believes that God is going to speak to him because he set himself up for deity. And so this is going to be some great, grandiose message that's going to stroke and feed his ego. I, I love that we have so many talented artists in our church. You heard from uh, musically gifted artists earlier. But we also have folks who can draw and paint and just create all kinds of beautiful, incredible things. And so uh, I had talked with Blake Allen uh, probably a couple months ago. And so throughout the course of our series here, uh, he and Trevor, Trevor Horzemp are going to provide some illustrations. So the church needs artists because we, we demonstrate God's glory. We communicate his excellence. We teach messages through the arts. They're so important for the church. So I love, I love um, Blake's uh, translation of of this story here. So verse 21, Ehud reached from his left hand, took the dagger from his right thigh. They would have never suspected this, never would, never would have even thought this was in the realm of possibility from a man who was disabled. Not only that, anyone who had any type of fighting experience or military background or training would have always drawn with the right hand from the left. So if there was a security check at any point, they would have been checking from the left side. But Ehud because he was appointed to this position, because of his faithfulness, they were probably accustomed to seeing him, and he was the perfect man for the job. He would have flown under the radar because of his disability. Eglon literally never saw this coming. 
And then it says in verse 22, even the hilt went in after the blade and the fat closed over the blade for he did not draw the dagger out of his belly. So, man, uh, some of you younger people, you know who Kirby is, right? And, and you can just imagine the sucking sound that this dagger would have made going into Eglon's fat. Kirby swallowed it. Even the hilt went in. And then it says his entrails came out. Literally the text said, junior high, okay? Literally what the text says, the dung came out. It's in the Bible. And Ehud went out through the porch, shut the doors of the upper room behind him, and locked them. When he had gone out, Eglon's servants came to look, and to their surprise, the doors of the upper room were locked. And so they said, well, he's probably attending to his needs in the cool chamber. Look at y'all. That's Bible code for bowel movement. <laughs> I'm serious. And you can just imagine these poor guards. At first, they're making some jokes about it. What is that smell? You know, do you hear any movement in there? No, but I smell one. See, but then it just got weirder and weirder. See, Eglon is meant to be funny. The, the picture here is like a, like a pin to an overfilled balloon. Kapow! It's also political humor. When you understand Israel against the, the Moabites, see, Eglon, just like a, a, a bad politician, is full of poo. It's like a good fart joke. It'll knock the wind out of you. <laughs> what, what do you call a cow's fluffer doodle? So remember Eglon's name, right? Little calf. What do you call a cow's fluffer doodle? Dairy air. <laughs> Verse 25. 26, but Ehud had escaped while they delayed, passed beyond the stone images and escaped to Syrah. Another important, disgusting detail. How in the world did Ehud escape? There's guards posted up outside the door that he came in. They're standing outside. They smell the smells. They're wondering what's going on, but they don't want to embarrass Eglon, so they remain outside of his chamber. How did Ehud get out? There's only one way. If you understand ancient uh, Middle Eastern construction back then, the only way out was through the plumbing. Yeah, the poo pipes, the sewer. It's disgusting, right? Actually had to crawl. That was the plan all along. Ehud knew that that was going to be his escape route. He knew that he was going to have to climb down into the toilet and follow the poop chute to make his escape. How does that apply to your life? <laughs> I really think it does. And again, junior hires, this is God's demonstration that he loves you, because I know I have all of your attention. See, are you above doing certain things that need to get done? Do you have a dog or a cat? Are you the one responsible for changing that stuff out? Do you give your parents guff about it? Are you letting hard things get in the way of God giving you a victory? Are you letting fear stop you from serving God wholeheartedly? And guys, I don't know about you, but personally, I hate plumbing jobs. Hate them. Sometimes we, we obey God like we respond to plumbing jobs. Oh, man, not again. No thanks, God. I'd rather not. Isn't there something else? How can I get around this? Isn't there a shortcut I can take? But if you're really going to be faithful, at some point, God is going to call you to roll up your sleeves. You're going to have to get messy. Serving God is a lot like that. Okay, what does God need from you to redeem your adversity and to make it a kingdom advantage? You've got to do the next hard thing. Standing in the face of the, the plumbing, standing in the face of the toilet, that hard thing that you're having to stare down, that hard thing in life that's holding you back, stopping you from what you know you need to do. Maybe there's a relationship in your life or there's a person in your life that you're treating like a plumbing job. Well, verse 27, 
And it happened when he arrived that he blew the trumpet in the mountains of Ephraim, makes it safely home. And the children of Israel went down with him from the mountains, and he led them. Then he said to them, Follow me, for the Lord has delivered your enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. And so they went down after him. They seized the fords of the Jordan, leading to Moab, and they did not allow anyone to cross over. And at that time they killed about 10,000 men of Moab, all stout men of valor. Not a man escaped. And so Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest for 80 years. Victory. Amazing story. God calls us, just like he did Ehud, to be fat, to be faithful, to make yourself available, to be teachable. You've got to trust him with your life. You've got to do the next hard thing. What's the result? God will deliver you. Just be patient. Just remain in it. See, the stories of our suffering, God can transform into stories of redemption. Because God loves to use limited, flawed people to do limitless things. Do you want to make a difference for God? I mean, do you, do you really? See, you don't have to be strong or beautiful or popular or skinny or gifted or smart. You, you just have to be faithful, available, and teachable. And his plan is always better than your plan. So stop holding back. What's got you so worked up? What's got you so afraid? What's got you so anxious? What's that hard thing in your life that's staring you down? What are you putting off? Maybe for you this morning, you have yet to truly trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You've yet to surrender to him. And maybe this is the moment that you need to do that. Maybe that's the decision that you've been putting off. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for giving us such an unbelievable story with uh, just fantastically gruesome details that we can learn a lot of lessons from. Um, pretty unforgettable, some of this stuff. And the fact that you, you put it in your word to show us that you love us and to reveal to us the true condition of our hearts. Because sometimes we just need the, the cookies on the bottom shelf and put into a language that we can understand. So we're thankful for you meeting us right where we're at whether we're in junior high or older, we thank you for your love. God, thank you for calling us to faithfulness. We see the advantages of making ourselves available to you. Thank you that you don't measure us on the basis of our ability because we really don't have a whole lot to offer you. You just call us to be available. God, we want to have humble teachable hearts that you can use for your glory. God, as we stare down the hard things in life, maybe it's a matter of just sheer obedience uh, that we've been putting off, been trying to figure out a way around. Help us to do that next hard thing. So in the next couple moments, would you just talk to God? Talk to him about your need to be faithful. Maybe you've yet to surrender everything to him. Talk with him about your need to be available. Maybe you need more humility, enough humility to be teachable. Maybe there's an apology or a demonstration of humility that you need to extend to someone else in your life. Would you talk to God about that right now? God, as you have blessed us with ears to hear this morning, I pray that you would give us hearts and determination to obey. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we have several next steps that we want to encourage you to take here at Grace. One of them that you've been hearing about is our Discover Grace class. Today is your last day to sign up for this. And so you can see these little half sheets out in the foyer. Fill that out. You can drop them in any of the black boxes out in the foyer. We also have our ladies' Bible study coming up. You can not too late to sign up for that. If you have already signed up and you have, you're in the count, you've ordered a book, 
you can go into Cindy's office. Your books are actually here. You can get started on your Bible study right away. You, um, Jamie would really love it if you could get chapter one under your belt in preparation for that study. And then we also have our men's breakfast. So guys, any guy in this room, any guy online, and if your son or grandson is old enough to be able to withstand a 15-minute devotional and be able to sit still for that, he's invited to come as well. Great father-son, uh, grandson opportunity. So go ahead and get signed up for that. And at this time, I just want to extend the Lord's blessing to you. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. We'll see you next week.